Thank you, Jordan. That was very sweet. My prop, I don't usually use props, but I will draw attention now and set it aside. Uh, we'll save it for a little bit. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, Jerome put me on the spot. We started discussing Wednesday. You might be ready. Okay, I said. And then a day or so later, well, maybe you don't need to. I said, okay. And then I showed up yesterday and he was here. I said, oh, are you planning to speak then? Well, I think I can. Okay. So then an hour or so later, he texted me and said, well, maybe you should go ahead and, and plan for it. I said, okay. Um, that's, uh, that's fine. It really is. Uh, my second assignment, I was working with a pastor, and we were pastoring three churches together. And the night before I had to speak, he would tell me which church he wanted me to go to. So I normally had two or three sermons I was working on at the same time. So I have a little bit of that experience, I guess. Uh, it's a privilege. Whenever I feel I'm, I'm allowed to spend some of God's spiritual time, it's humbling and it's a privilege and I take it very seriously. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for those that are watching at home. I'd like to start with prayer before I speak. Father in heaven, thank you for this gathering of your sons and daughters, your children. They're so precious to you, Father, and you give us your word to teach us the many things you have in store for us. So I ask and pray that you would speak through the words today that your scriptures would resonate with each one of us, whatever you have to say to us. Sometimes we can look at the same scripture a dozen times, and it impacts us differently each time, depending on how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. So I ask and pray your blessing and your presence, and I thank you in Jesus' holy and righteous name. I don't usually like to use this many words, but I'm going to give you two short devotionals up front, because I think... It sets the stage for what I want to share with you this morning, our congregation, Radiant Christian Life. This is from a website that I visit quite often. It's called UCB Canada. It's written by a group of pastors, and it's written to Christians and fellow church leaders. So these are back-to-back -back writings, but I think it frames something that we all at times question. I'll just jump right into it. It says, Richard Dawkins said, and he's a well-known atheist, I didn't know that, I guess I don't know that many well-known atheists, but he is, he said, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Maybe that's why I don't write, follow him. But the truth is, now we'll leave his quote behind us, the truth is, most great scientific minds from the past, brilliant men, who founded and developed key disciplines of science were creationists. For example, in physics, Newton, Faraday, Maxwell, Kelvin. In chemistry, Boyle, Dalton, Pascal, Ramsey. In biology, Ray, Pasteur, Mendel, Linnaeus. In geology, Steno, Woodward, Brewster, Agassiz. Astronomy, Kepler, Galileo, Herschel, Maunder. Were these men ignorant, stupid, or insane? Sir Isaac Newton managed to discover the composition of light, deduce the laws of motion, invent calculus, compute the speed of sound, and define universal gravitation while believing our universe could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Interesting, isn't it? But they would be considered ignorant by some. In 2007, Newsweek magazine survey, I don't follow a lot of surveys, but they kind of give us a snapshot at times. So in 2007, 78% of people polled attributed creation to God, while only 13% believed in naturalistic evolution. Don't be intimidated by non-believers is our admonition. For the Bible says, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, they know the truth about God, because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Though through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, there is a God, and he wants you to know him on a personal level. Everyone in this room 
no matter where you are in your spiritual walk with the Lord. And maybe you don't know him that well. Maybe you're afraid of getting too close. Maybe you've been disappointed, you've been hurt, you've been let down. But I love the fact that Scripture tells us God's standing there all day long, holding out his hand to us, welcoming us. The second devotion continues from Romans 1, and it adds verse 21. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. That's New Living Translation. So in other words, God says he's told us who he is. He's made it clear. He's made it accessible to us. He's revealed himself, and yet sometimes we don't see God clearly. Contemplating then, back to my second devotion, contemplating the amazing design of our universe, people very intelligent discovered it. They think there's a designer out there, a creator. Another physicist and Nobel laureate, Arno Penzazzi, tries to explain it this way. He said, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Harvard biologist Stephen Jay Gould describes humans as a glorious accident of evolution that needed 60 trillion contingent events. Cosmologists estimate the Earth to be, again, this is somebody else, a source, 4.55 billion years old. So to accomplish those 60 trillion events, it would necessitate more than 36 essential events a day for 4.55 billion years. Uh, you know, for me, sometimes a decade is a long time. I can't imagine 1 billion, let alone 4.55. It would take that long, 60 trillion events, 36 essential events a day for 4.55 billion years just to get to one thing, Homo sapiens. And conveniently, each of these 36 new events would have to occur in the right place at the right time in the right sequence. And this doesn't take into account the astronomical number of accidents required to form the tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of individuals' ecosystems. One individual put it this way, and this is what I wanted to get to. I think this is a rather interesting way to frame it. The odds would be better of creating Homo sapiens out of these 36 events every day for four and a half billion years. The odds would be better getting hit by lightning at the moment you won the Powerball lottery while dying in the crash of a plane that got struck by a meteor. Oh, really? Dr. Francis Collins, director of Human Genome Project, a believer himself, describes exploring nature as a way of getting a glimpse of God's mind and observes all truth is God's truth, and therefore God can hardly be threatened by scientific discoveries. Interesting. That's framing what I'd like to share with you today, part of God's word. As I was pondering that and thinking about where does that fit in all of Scripture, the reality is this. Do you think God does anything haphazardly? Is anything by mistake, an accident? Oh, whoops, I guess I didn't mean to do that. God is so amazing and so wonderful and so awesome. Now, we all come to God with certain beliefs, expectations. As we grow closer to him, we begin to depend upon him. We look to him for things, but then many times, certainly all of us at times have been disappointed and wondered, what is God up to in my life? I was thinking about some of the, the pet names the Bible uses as he refers to us. Uh, one of my favorites is, of course, he calls us his children. He calls us his beloved. He calls us in Psalms the, the apple of his eye. And I always felt that that was better for the ladies than the guys, but I think uh, we all appreciate what the meaning is. But one of my favorites, and you probably haven't come across this too often, is 
God is going to make each of us a new sharp threshing instrument with teeth. And that's an actual literal translation of that word in Hebrew. It only, it's only found three times. But when I first heard that, I thought, wow, I'm a guy. I mean, I could be a warrior. He's going to make me a, a new threshing instrument sharp, with sharp teeth. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? God has a plan and a purpose for us. But sometimes we're unsure. We see things and we don't exactly know how they fit. I see this message as I share it with you today to be a connection to what I've talked about a few times over the last six months about how God assembles the body. He puts us together. He's assembling something because he has a plan and a purpose. And one of the verses that I like to build this upon is 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. And it says, for we are... Paul writing to the church, we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. So you and I, we're assembled here today as a part of the radiant Christian church, but we're a part of the body of Christ. We are the assembly that God is putting together because he has a plan and a purpose. And Jerome has been talking about the things that we have done in the past as a congregation. And he sees us in a transition state somewhat, but as God is providing new opportunities and more open doors for us, what does he have in store? I'm going to let him fill in all the details on that, but he's excited and he's conveyed a good bit of it already to us, the elders and the trustees and the staff, but he will be sharing all of that with you as well. But we, as a part of the assembly that God is putting together, have a plan and a purpose. We don't always know exactly where we fit. Sometimes we feel like we're out in left field or we're left out of the mainstream or we're not important. And yet God says we all are something very special. This is where. I pull out my homemade, looks very nice and homemade, uh, prop. And I had a great challenge trying to get this on short notice, Pastor, but uh, it was a wonderful opportunity. Okay, for those of you that don't know, and this will be the introduction, this is going to be the quiver, okay? And as my wife told me this morning as I was putting these last things together, she goes, well, really, if it's a quiver, shouldn't it be leather and be really worn? Yes, dear, I couldn't get one that last minute. And these are some arrows, Keep these two pictures in mind. I'll pull them out a few times. But I wanted you to have a visual. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background after we read together Isaiah 49, verses 2 and 3. And I think this time I'll read it right out of my NIV Bible. And there's a reason I'll tell you when I get there why I've chosen the NIV. God is speaking in a much bigger picture to the church and to his servant, Isaiah. He says, listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. That's Isaiah 49, verse 1. It says, before I was born, the Lord called me. Excuse me, Isaiah is writing this. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword, and in the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So... Isaiah says that God made him a sharpened, a polished arrow. Now, at the time this was written, obviously, and for hundreds, if not thousands of years, most arrows were made out of wood, okay? They were assembled, interestingly, very carefully, but they were assembled for a specific purpose. We'll talk about a little bit of that today. But what Isaiah is saying, interestingly, is he first made me as a polished arrow, And then it says he placed me in his quiver. Okay, what a beautiful picture. Old Covenant, Old Testament, that's lived out in the new. So this this quiver, very poor, I'm sorry, best I could do short notice. I'm sure God's is so much more beautiful and wonderful. But the reality is, the picture here that I want you to carry with you is that God has a quiver. And each one of us has been carefully selected and then prepared and then placed in the quiver. Why? 
Well, let's ask him. One day we all get to ask him why he put us in that quiver and maybe left us there for an awful long time. I don't know. But I love the next verse because this connects to the new covenant and where we are as a congregation and, and as fellow believers. He said to me, you are my servant, specifically to Isaiah, but also to his people Israel. He said, you are my servant Israel in whom I will deplay, display excuse me, my splendor. Back to that verse I said in the beginning that God uses his body of believers to demonstrate him to the world. You and I are not only a group of believers, we represent Christ wherever we go. Sometimes we do that amazingly, wonderfully, and sometimes we do that very poorly. The best message of the church is the members. Sometimes the biggest detriment are the members. But God's chosen us because he has a plan and a purpose. I love the fact that the verse here says, he has made me a polished arrow. Okay, pause here. I just want to say that sometimes we can take a short section of verses and try to force it into something, and I don't want to do that today. I want you to reflect as we're reading through and, and kind of revealing a little bit about this assembly of an arrow, uh, what we look like to God and what his plan and his purpose is. Isaiah understood it. Jesus said it was for all of Israel. Then Paul comes along, New Testament, New Covenant, now we're in a new season, if you will, and now he says, I want to use you, the body of believers, to make my name known in the world. And I say, but I'm not up to that. How, how, how do you want to use me? Why have you chosen me, an imperfect being? Why am I, with all my limitations, my foibles, my weaknesses, why would you use us? Because he's up to something. So as you think about this, Think about the fact that you and I are called then this arrow. Very simply, okay, I'll go back and tell you I have a little bit of experience. If some of you have uh, a lot of history in being an archer, if you have a great deal of expertise, forgive me if I stumble on a few things. For about five years, late 60s, early 70s, I lived out on a farm in Wisconsin, and there was an archery club that was about three or four miles from my house. And we would go down there almost every day in summer at the end of the day after the shooting range closed and we would go find used arrows. We had a neighbor that would buy those arrows from us, okay? I didn't know they were worth anything. Uh, we were given as little as a nickel, as much as a dollar for an arrow. This is back in the 60s, forgive me. I paid more than that for this arrow at Walmart, okay? Uh, by the way, I was carded too. They had to make sure I was old enough to buy one. I didn't know that. Okay. But then she looked at my beard and said, I think you're okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, but this friend of ours, a neighbor, taught me so much about the assembly of these arrows. And what I want to do is just briefly look at these because when God says through Isaiah that he's chosen us and polished us as an arrow and then put us in this quiver... Because he has a use for us. We come along before God at times and say, but God, do you really know what you're doing? Are you sure you want me in that quiver with all these wonderful, beautiful, strategic arrows and you're going to put me? I'm kind of a field arrow, okay? I've got a dull tip. I've got poor feathers. I've got a knock that's now kind of loose and it doesn't click on that. For those of you that have shot bow and arrow, you know a little bit of what I'm talking about. Okay, so this arrow is not that complex, but it is always very carefully assembled. It has a point. There are different kinds of tips. I'll just throw them at you a little bit later. Don't want to spend a lot of time with that. But each one has a specific purpose. Then the shaft. Back in the day that this was written, they were probably all made simply out of wood. They had to be cured and very carefully selected. And then over and over again, they were turned, they were straightened because it had to, to fly true. Then the feathers were selected. These are very bad feathers. Uh, these are plastic something. Don't like these at all. I learned how to take very carefully a feather, a fletch, and glue it on there very carefully. 
and some had four, some had even five. This one has basically three. You'll notice that there are uh, two different colors in this because there's only three. And the white one is more or less the, the aligning arrow. And it will go away from what you're aiming at. And it will be very straight that way. Sorry, I shouldn't point that at you, Josh. Um, it's not deadly, even though they carded me. Uh, those arrow, the, those, excuse me, feathers are very carefully selected. And it was interesting, as I was reading some of the background, and a fellow did a lot of research on this. He said, you want to choose arrows, excuse me, feathers that you put on your arrow from the same side of the bird because they will fly the same way. So it's very important that you do that. And this little thing at the end, uh, it's called a notch. It's important to be on there. Uh, it's important because it aligns the arrow. And it also, when it's new, it clicks very almost loudly when you click it onto the, uh, the bow's string. Okay. My wife and I taught uh, archery for a couple of years at a summer camp. That was great fun. Uh, we got to see the kind of the uh, enjoyment and the eye-opening experience that kids would have. And I remembered the things that we experienced. But very simply then, there are different components that make up an arrow. Okay? I want to think about this as we look at it from God's perspective. This arrow by itself is what? It's an instrument. Can it do anything of itself? No, I don't think so. It's not real deadly. You hear that little ting? Not very powerful, can't do a thing. But in the hands of an archer, it can be deadly. And in fact, he selects it very carefully. In fact, it is selected when it was made back in the day that these verses were written. It was selected you know what? God tells us you and I are selected. Jesus said that I have chosen you. You didn't choose me. And yet at times we tend to think I chose to follow God. Well, God started knocking before you accepted that call. So he's chosen the shaft to turn into an arrow. Okay? He selects it very carefully. In fact, the, the world-renowned archers are very careful in what they select to make it. And they would cut it out, and then they would begin to dry it and process it. So different now because you can buy aluminum, you can buy fiberglass. But the reality is back then it was so special the way it was done. And when you think of this picture as God shows us, and then he's preparing us, how? By drying us out. Scraping some of the stuff off that doesn't belong, that impedes. And obviously, for an arrow, it's got to cut through the wind. So it has to be very carefully polished. And that's what God has done with each one of us. There, there is a term uh, referred to as tillering, where you strive to strengthen this shaft and make it stronger and more powerful, and so it will be more effective. When you think of all that background, that's what God has done as he's chosen each one of us. He wants it to be straight enough so that it will hit the mark that it's aimed at. What's interesting is I was reading this. The, uh, there, there's a discussion about the different kind of arrows, target arrow, display arrow. In the Bible, it talks about a random arrow. I don't want to go there and spend all that time, but if you're interested, it's in 1 Kings chapter 22. And King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat had gone to war together. And King Ahab kept asking God, well, are you going to give us the victory? Jehoshaphat put it before the prophets and asked the Lord. They all said, yes, God's going to give you the victory. It wasn't good enough for Ahab. So he asked somebody else, his own personally selected prophet, to confirm what God had said. And then he was uh, reluctantly willing to go to war. Interestingly, he was killed by a random arrow. If you read the story, it's incredible. Somebody, it says, shot a random arrow out through a window, and it struck in between the armor of King Ahab, and he was killed. 
He was the king of Israel. The king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, was a good king. But those arrows have an amazing, amazing purpose in God's plan. And he likens us to those arrows that he's assembled. The notch is important, as I said, to connect with the string so that when it is pulled, it propels it in the right direction at the right speed. Interestingly, if you buy arrows, it will tell you that arrows are good up to a certain pound weight of force produced by the bow. A friend of mine shot bow and arrow all the time. Uh, he was so good at it, he kept getting a more powerful bow. Eventually, he then went hunting for bear up in northern Wisconsin, and he killed a grizzly bear with only a bow and arrow. Uh, a little braver fellow, I think, than I would be, but he had to get real close with his bow and arrow. But he killed it, and then he, he uh, displayed it after that. The fletching, the wing feathers are, again, very carefully selected. When it gets to the point, I think, not the point of my sermon, but the point of the arrow. There you go. <laughs> Pastor caught that. Uh, there are different points. And what's interesting is this is where, as I begin to think about this, I think sometimes in the church we look at other people and we see people we think are succeeding or successful or they're blessed. And then we think, we talk with God about, God, how come they're blessed more than I am? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something you're trying to teach me? God has each of us in different places at different times. These are his arrows, and he assembles them, and he puts different tips on at different times for different purposes and different reasons. Some are just the target points, okay? These are the, the kind, they don't look like much. They're oftentimes roughed up. Uh, when I would find an arrow and try to get some money from my neighbor, uh, target arrows, you're lucky if you got a nickel, probably, unless the shaft was perfect and everything else was good. He could always put a new tip on it. But they're not very valuable, okay? But they're important because they're used for target practice so that you get used to trying to hit that target. And you're going to improve as you use it over and over again. Some of us are target arrows. God's going to use us as he plans and as he purposes, and we don't know how that will be. There was a place I was going as a chaplain, and I was beginning to wonder, I mean, what am I doing? I show up, I walk around and talk to people. I'm there as a representative of uh, marketplace chaplains. I'm there to share the gospel if they ask. And there were many times I felt like, am I really making a difference? And one day as I was getting ready to leave, a lady ran across the parking lot and said, I just want to tell you, she said, how much we appreciate the chaplains coming to visit us on a weekly basis. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. She said, we really felt, feel cared for. So thank you for that. Oh, by the way, she said, this is my last day. I'm taking a new job, so I won't see you anymore. <laughs> so as I left, I thought, okay, may maybe looking now back, I'm just a target arrow. She was being exposed to something that God wanted her to know that she was cared for at that particular time by a company and by someone who was representing God, hopefully. Okay, they get used a lot, sometimes abused. They don't seem very valuable, but God has a plan and a purpose for them. Target points. They have a very sharp point. They're designed to penetrate targets, but then easily be removed. Okay, again, a purpose. Uh, those were the ones you loved to find if they were, uh, had gone through the bale and you could pull them out the backside. They were almost undamaged. If you were lucky, the feathers weren't even hurt by that, but they were important. Field points are similar, but they have a distinct shoulder so that missed outdoor shots don't be, uh, come stuck in another obstacle, so they're easily retrieved again. But then there is the, uh, the broadhead, and I don't have one here to show you, but a broadhead is a killer arrow head, arrow point. Uh, and it's what deer hunters who go deer hunting with bow and arrow use. Because it's very sharp, it will penetrate, but it will cut through the flesh and kill. Sorry if you're a bunny hugger, I don't mean to be too gross about that. But for hunters, they love those type. And then there's a bodkin, 
which is not very much in use anymore. In fact, it was used probably through the Middle Ages. Uh, it was different in the sense that it was designed for piercing armor. Now, as I read about this, there's a little bit of debate about it, whether that's true or not, but there are people that have field tested a similar one, and it was able to penetrate armor. Now, some of you have been in the military, you've worn vests. My son is a cop up in Milwaukee. He wears a Kevlar vest that's supposed to stop a bullet, start it to spread, and in most cases, it, it will spare your life. Uh, these bodkins can actually penetrate that. They've tested this, and it's able to do that. Because it stays very narrow, it doesn't blow up and expand the way a bullet would. Interesting, different, different tips on there. The cresting, not only are they very important, the length, uh, the placement of them, because then it gets it, as it leaves the, uh, as it leaves the, the bow and arrow, can't think of the string, excuse me, as it leaves the string, they will often begin to spin. They don't just stay straight, so those arrows will help start directing it. Just think about this. God says we're like those arrows in his quiver. So he's crafted us because he's got a place. He's going to send us somewhere. He's got a job for us to do. Uh, it's not just for looks. Now, there are different kinds of arrows. Some, as I said earlier, uh, they're the target. There's a display arrow. And there's even a reference in scripture about that. The random arrow. There's the misfired arrow. The random arrow took a, a king's life, but there's the misfired. One of the worst things you can do if you have a, a nice bow and arrow is uh, pull the string back and let it go. And the arrow falls off because it falls off. The notch wasn't put on correctly. It's called a whiff or a misfire, and it sounds terrible. It can actually destroy the string if it's done too much. There's also a broken and repaired arrow the Bible talks about. And then there's the forgotten or the hidden arrow. And that's really what I wanted to get to as well as I kind of wrap this up. If you think about this, God has a quiver. Very poor representation. But God has a quiver. Amazing, wonderful beautiful, uh, functional arrows that he can use at any time. And in that quiver, he's placed us. And we're one of his arrows. And he has a plan and a purpose. He's going to use us somehow. Our congregation, as, as God has continued to direct and redirect us, he has a place for us. And I love the fact that Pastor keeps talking about we want to make a difference in Westfield. We want to make a difference in Carmel and Noblesville. God's placed us or planted us here. Okay, God's placed us in his quiver. Now, we're here temporarily. I think what Jordan said was wonderful, that you're here for a season. Maybe you're only here for a season. How long is that? You determine that. I love that statement, though, that God says he wants us to grow where we've been planted. Because if God's involved in it, if God is a part of it, he's going to use us if we yield ourselves to him. When you think about an arrow, when you think about how God may use you, think about the fact that for right now, God has assembled you as a part of this quiver, the Radiant Christian Life Church. It was founded with a vision of making a difference in people's lives. And for each of you that have invested and spent time here, thank you for that because you're making a difference in people's lives. And you see it on a week-to-week -week basis. You hear the testimonies. And sometimes we think that testimony is more important than Scripture, but God wants us to have both. His Word teaches us of who He is and what He's up to. Testimony merely confirms it. It reminds us, yeah, this is what God's doing. So thank you for coming along and being a part of that journey. My last couple verses is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Excuse me, 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, meaning our Savior, our Lord and Master, our King, our Savior, a living stone, he was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, each one of us, like living stones, are being built up 
as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Boy, that sounds an awful lot like what he told Isaiah that he said Israel would be. God wants to use us. And he's placed us in the quiver. And sometimes we may feel like we're forgotten. We've been left there. But if he puts you in his quiver, he's got a place for you. He's got a job for you. You may yet await that assignment, but he's got a place and a reason and a purpose for you in his life. And when he fires that arrow, you can be guaranteed it will hit the mark. Please join me and choir, if you would come up, please, band. Father in heaven, thank you for the awesome privilege, the awesome gift to be called as your sons and daughters. You have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. You put us in your quiver, and now you're ready to use us. And the time may not seem yet, but you know the perfect time and the perfect way and the perfect reason. We thank you that you've prepared and chosen each one of us, and you've done that because Jesus Christ made it all accessible. We thank you for that amazing gift that you've called us to be your sons and daughters, not just for now, but forever and ever. And in Jesus' holy name, we pray.